this tree illustration, the magic, if you will, behind this model is the ongoing ethic of confession and getting rid of stuff, i.e. Re repentance, that's what I call it, in the midst of other people. So we always talk about what's happening in our hearts and we get rid of things in our life that aren't helping in front of other people. If we don't do this in front of other people, then, then we begin to go right back into living into fear. And I've had this, I've had fears my whole life. Like I'm not, like I'm so proud of all, all, the, all the teens that were raising their hand on the first day. That was not me when I was growing up. I was like, I don't not want to raise my hand. And I still do that today when we have like all hands calls. Hey, who's got a question? I'm like, well, not me. I don't want to do that. But every time we notice fear in our hearts, we, we have to say, you know, that's fear. That's not good. I'm going to step into it. I'm going to raise my hand in class, even though people might make, make fun of me, but I'm going to do it. Guys, if you like a girl, you need to go and tell her. Okay? I'm not pointing at, I'm not looking at anybody in this room, but don't live in fear. And if she rejects you, who cares? It's awesome. You need, you need, a, you need a little bit of that. Okay? Just two examples of fear. Um, here, here's the thing. Confession, though, it's always messy. This is not clean. It's not going to be pretty. There might be some ugly tears involved. Just this weekend... Several couples in this room, and I get goosebumps thinking about this, brought some things to the light, and there were tears last night. There were tears last night. And it might have been hard, but you had the conversations, and you're better for it, and you're going to make it. And some gnarly things were exposed last night, and it's going to be okay if you stick together and you push, you push through it. Okay? Um, we do have a couple that, that couldn't make it back. Um, someone got hurt last night. You know, they were trying to recover from their surgery, and it, it didn't go well. But, but um, yeah, but everybody else came back. Um, confession is, is messy. And also, whenever you uproot one of these things, it's not just it's messy. And when you pull up, there's, a, there's this gaping hole. A gaping hole needs to be filled with truth. So it's not just we pull these things out, but I'm replacing it with truth. So if I pull out this root of control, like, like that picture that I showed my daughter, where I said, I'm going to write down what's happening and why you're yelling at everybody. She said, well, I want to control you guys. Replace it with truth. What's the truth? The truth is I don't need to control everybody. I just control my, my own emotions and the way I react. So as you, as you pull these things out, replace it with truth. Okay, we're going to transition into, into, uh, into how to deal with, with something that's, that, that we all, every single person in this room deals with, okay? So if you look at this picture, that's a, that's a healthy tree. A tree that has roots is in deception. A person who has unforgiveness in their heart has these bricks built up. And what about this poison one? Like what are the things in our lives that that are adding fuel to the fire, okay? And I'm going to talk about social media, okay? I'm going to talk about social media because it's important. Now, there, there are studies that show the effects of social media on our lives and how it relates to this and the way we behave. There's a direct correlation. I'm going to play a video from a very a smart man named Simon Sinek. And... Uh, I'm going to play this. I'm just going to fast forward it to minute three, minute 308. We know that engagement with social media and our cell phones releases a chemical called dopamine. That's why when you get a text, it feels good, right? So, you know, we've all had it where you're feeling a little bit down or feeling a little bit lonely. And so you send out 10 texts to 10 friends, you know, hi, 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 hi. Because <laughs> it feels good when you get a response. It's why we count the likes, it's why we go back 10 times to see if, and if it's going, if our, my Instagram is growing slower, I would, I, I, did I do something wrong? Do they not like me anymore, right? The, the trauma for young kids to be unfriended, right? Because we know when you get it, you get a hit of dopamine, which feels good. It's why we like it, it's why we keep going back to it. Dopamine is the exact same chemical 
that makes us feel good when we smoke, when we drink, and when we gamble. In other words, it's highly, highly addictive, right? We have age restrictions on smoking, gambling, and uh, alcohol, and we have no age restrictions on social media and cell phones, which is the equivalent of opening up the liquor cabinet and saying to our teenagers, hey, by the way, this adolescence thing, if it gets you down. <laughs> but that's basically what's happening. That's basically what's happening, right? That's basically what happened. You have an entire generation that has access to an addictive, numbing chemical called dopamine through social media and cell phones as they're going through the high stress of adolescence. Why is this important? Almost every alcoholic discovered alcohol when they were teenagers. When we're very, very young, the only approval we need is the approval of our parents. And as we go through adolescence, we make this transition where we now need the approval of our peers. Very frustrating for our parents, very important for us. It allows us to acculturate outside of our immediate families into the broader tribe, right? It's a highly, highly stressful and anxious period of our lives, and we're supposed to learn to rely on our friends. Some people, quite by accident, discover alcohol and numbing effects of dopamine to help them cope with the stresses and anxieties of adolescence. Unfortunately, that becomes hardwired in their brains, and for the rest of their lives, when they suffer significant stress, they will not turn to a person, they will turn to the bottle. Social stress, financial stress, career stress, that's pretty much the primary reasons why an alcoholic drinks, right? What's happening is, because we're allowing unfettered access to these dopamine-producing devices and media, Basically, it's becoming hardwired, and what we're seeing is as they grow older, too many kids don't know how to form deep, meaningful relationships. Their words, not mine. They will admit that many of their friendships are superficial. They will admit that their friends, that they don't count on their friends, they don't rely on their friends, they have fun with their friends, but they also know that their friends will cancel on them if something better comes along. Deep, meaningful relationships are not there because they've never practiced the skill set, and worse, they don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. So when significant stress starts to show up in their lives, they're not turning to a person, they're turning to a device, they're turning to social media, they're turning to these things which offer temporary relief. We know, the science is clear, we know that people who spend more time on Facebook suffer higher rates of depression than people who spend less time on Facebook. These things balanced. Alcohol is not bad, too much alcohol is bad. Gambling is fun, too much gambling is dangerous. There's nothing wrong with social media and cell phones. It's the imbalance. If you're sitting at dinner with your friends and you're texting somebody who's not there, that's a problem, that's an addiction. If you're sitting in a meeting with people you're supposed to be listening to and speaking and you put your phone on the table, face up or face down, I don't care, that sends a subconscious message to the room that you're, not just, you're just not that important to me right now, right? That's what happens. And the fact that you cannot put it away is because you are addicted, right? If you wake up and you check your phone before you say good morning to your girlfriend, boyfriend, or spouse, you have an addiction. And like all addiction, in time, it'll destroy relationships, it'll cost time, and it'll cost money, and it'll make your life worse. So you have a generation growing up with lower self-esteem that doesn't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. Now you add in the sense of impatience. They've grown up in a world of instant gratification. You want to buy something, you go on Amazon, it arrives the next day. You want to watch a movie, log on and watch a movie. You don't check movie times. You want to watch a TV show, binge. You don't even have to wait week to week to week, right? I know people who skip seasons just so they can binge at the end of the season, right? Instant gratification. You want to go on a date, you don't even have to learn how to be like, hey. <laughs> You don't even have to learn and practice that skill. You don't have to be the uncomfortable one who says, says yes when you mean no, and says no when you mean no, and yes when you... You don't have to swipe right. Bang, I'm a stud. <laughs> right? You don't even have to learn the social coping mechanisms. Everything you want, you can have instantaneously. Everything you want, instant gratification. Except job satisfaction and strength of relationships, there ain't no app for that. They are slow meandering, uncomfortable, messy processes. And so I keep meeting these wonderful, fantastic, idealistic, hardworking, smart kids. They just graduated school. They're in their entry-level job. I sit down with them and I go, how's it going? They go, I think I'm gonna quit. I'm like, why? They're like, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, you've been here eight months. <laughs> you know? It's as if they're standing at the foot of a mountain and they have this abstract concept called impact that they wanna have in the world which is the summit. What they don't see is the mountain. 
I don't care if you go up the mountain quickly or slowly, but there's still a mountain. And so what this young generation needs to learn is patience. That some things that really, really matter, like love or job fulfillment, joy, love of life, self-confidence, a skill set, any of these things, all of these things take time. Sometimes you can expedite pieces of it, but the overall journey is arduous and long and difficult. And if you don't ask for help and learn that skill set, you will fall off the mountain or you will, the worst case scenario, the worst case scenario, and we're already seeing it, the worst case scenario is we're seeing an increase in suicide rates, we're seeing an increase in this generation. We're seeing an increase in accidental deaths due to drug overdoses. We're seeing more and more kids drop out of school or take leaves of absence due to depression. Unheard of. These are all, this, is, this is really bad. The best case scenario, the best, those are all bad cases, right? The best case scenario is you'll have an entire population growing up and going through life and just never really finding joy. They'll never really find deep, deep fulfillment in work or in life. They'll just just waft through life and it'll be just, it's fine. How, how, how's your job? It's fine, it's the same as yesterday. How's your relationship? Yeah, it's fine. Like that's, that's the best case scenario, which leads me to the, the fourth point, which is environment, which is we're taking this amazing group of young, fantastic kids who were just dealt a bad hand, it's no fault of their own, and we put them in corporate environments that care more about the numbers than they do about the kids. They care more about the short-term gains than the long-term life of this young human being. We care more about the year than the lifetime, right? And so we are putting them in corporate environments that aren't helping them build their confidence, that aren't helping them learn the skills of cooperation, that aren't helping them overcome the challenges of a digital world and finding more balance, that isn't helping them overcome the need to have instant gratification and teach them the joys and impact and the fulfillment you get from working hard over on something for a long time that cannot be done in a month or even in a year. Okay, and he, he, goes, he goes on and on um, about the dangers of social media. He says there, Simon Sinek says that uh, they're not social media is not necessarily bad per se. He calls it a balance thing. I would say it's a worship thing. We're all created to worship something. We all will worship something. People will pour their, will pour their lives into something that they believe they need, and that's where the deception is. If I'm using these things, and I do use some of these things, if I then believe that I need it, that's when it becomes dangerous. But also know this, that social media is addiction is just a fruit on this tree. Parents, you could go up to your kids and then whack this fruit off and says, delete your social media right now. And they would have to do it because you're the boss. But behavior modification is a cheap substitute for heart renovation. And if our jobs is to pursue what's going on down here, if there is worship of approval of my friends or my whoever, and I believe I need that, that should be addressed first. And then it can move up to you better delete that. If, if, that's, if that's what you're, I'm not telling anybody what to do. I'm just saying behavior modification hangs out up here. And what we've learned is this is way more valuable in long term. Okay. It's way more valuable and long term. But if this, is, if this is affecting us, and I'm not just talking about the teenagers in the room, if these things are affecting us, if it's first thing in the morning I wake up and the first thing I do is stare at my screen, that's a problem. And so we're going to create boundaries for our own lives because if you're tired of this, if this is wearing you out, you don't want any more of these, something has to change. If you like what you're getting, keep doing what you're doing. If you don't like what you're getting, you gotta change what you gotta change something. Something, something has to go. Something has to go. Uh, I practice what's called, it's the practice called a benevolent detachment. 
one of my favorite authors, John Eldridge, talks about this. I apologize for a lot of words here, but he uses the word detachment. Mature adults have learned to create healthy distance between themselves and the things that they have become entangled with. Such is the word detachment. So detachment, I'm, I'm practicing benevolent detachment right now. Um, I don't read the news. I, I get my news from when I go to work and they, they, they brief us on what's going on around the world, things that's important for my job. But I, I am off the news because it's just depressing. And we were never created to know every atrocity in the world at the swipe of a, of a finger. Anyways, it's overwhelming. I'm, I'm still trying to manage my own life, let alone everybody else's problems in the world. So getting untangled in the quagmire means peeling apart the Velcro by which this person, relationship, crisis, or global issue has attached itself to you. Social media overloads our empathy. So he uses the word benevolent in referring to uh, being kind when you do this. Okay. So you can practice uh, benevolent detachment. This is a book I read. I brought this book with me to deployment in 2020. And uh, you know we got locked down when we were on deployment in, in the Middle East. And I had nothing to do but to read this book. And, uh, and there's a way to get your life back. It, it might start with getting rid of some social media platforms. It's honestly just sucking up way too much of our time. I am glad I work in, in, a, in a building where cell phones are not allowed. I think that is genius. Simon Sinek says, he, he goes, he encourages, he's a con, he consults multi-million dollar corporations. He goes, no cell phones in the, in the conference room. And productivity shot up, apparently. Okay. I think they should shut down all that stuff and we can just go to work and work. That'd be, that'd be pretty awesome, right? Okay, so are we gonna commit to this? Something gonna change? Something's gotta change. I need less of this in my life. I did create uh, an Instagram handle for suicide, um, suicide prevention. So it can be used, social media can be used for good. I'm not saying it's all bad. I've created one uh, and so when I, post, when I post things on it, then I just get, I get back off. I get back off, but I will confess, sometimes I'll be like, oh, that's cool. Oh, and then next thing you know, 30 minutes are gone. An hour is gone. I'm, I'm being real here, and, and what did I do? I just, it's just an endless scroll, and that's how they design it. They specifically design it to suck you in, and you are the product. There's no such thing as a free product, because if it's free, then you are the product. Okay, no more quotes from a Social Dilemma. You can watch that documentary by yourself. Okay, so we're, that's, that's that for that section. Here's what we're going to do. Get another blank, blank piece of paper. And uh, for the teens, this is what we did. I had your, your, your parents do this the other day. Um, if you're right-handed, I want you to put the pen in your left hand. If you're left-handed, put the pen in your right hand. And... Uh, the last part of this, this tree illustration is breaking generational curses. This word means different things to different people. I, I would just also call it patterns in your family line that need to break. Patterns in your family line that need to break there. You say no more. I, am, I have a little bit of shame when I say this, but I grew up in a family. My grandma was racist. She, she was racist. And she told us who we should marry and who we shouldn't marry. And I remember this as a kid. I was really young. She goes, don't marry the, and then she, you know, fill in the blank. And I go, well, Grandma, um, this girlfriend's that, you know? It was just so confusing to me as a little kid. So I, I stand up today, and I say, racism will not occur in my family. It's not. I tell my kids. You're going to fall in love one day. If you do, you marry whoever you want. I don't care where they're from. I, I, we don't care. If you love them, then that's what it's going to be. There's, there's going to be no racism in my family because I, I know that it was in my family, and I'm going to break that curse. You, you see what I'm saying? The way we talk, the way we think, some habits, if there's drugs in your family, the most... Some of the most inspirational, solid people that
that I know. I'm thinking of my friends who grew up with alcoholism in the house, and they just said, I've seen it. I'm not doing that. So take your offhand and just, and just close your eyes, see what comes out. And then when, when you've exhausted that, you can write with your other hand. But put your pen to paper and say, what are the things that exist in your family line, from your grandpa, your great-grandpa, things that are common in your family that you want to cut off? Oh, no, I'm mean, sorry, every, everybody, everybody, uh, parents and teens. So, so if, you're, if you're a parent in here, what are things that were passed down to you from your parents that you don't want to pass down to your kids? And teenagers, be honest. What are things you saw in grandma and grandpa and auntie and uncle that you say, I, I don't want to be like that? It could be anything. It could be be a diet, the way you say things, think things, do things. Okay, go ahead. And I'll just reiterate again that, you know, safety is, safety is number one, so let's just look at our own uh, papers. Safety is key. This, this will be your personal commitment. I will not, I will not pass this through. If you, so, if you feel comfortable enough, you can share it with your parents. Parents, if you feel courageous, you can share your lists with your children. We want to hear your truth. We want to hear the things that bother you so we can make changes. Okay. Is, that, is everybody good? Okay, can we, should we move on? Yeah. Anybody, anybody need more time? No worries, no worries. Okay. The, the next thing that I had scheduled was a break, but we are, we are moving fast, and we can be ahead of schedule. Is that okay? Okay, if you need, if you need, you go get your... Um, it's, been, it's, been a heavy, it's been a heavy week. I know. It's been super heavy. We've, we've talked about things that, that um, the majority of people in the world don't talk about, but we do it courageously, and this is going to be an ongoing thing. We're going we're to commit to this. Um, we, because it's been so heavy, I want to I play a song for us. I referenced it yesterday. It's called, uh, it's, a, it's one of my favorite people in the whole world. His name is Mike Donahue. He wrote a song. He used to be part of a band called 10th Avenue North. And he wrote this song. Um, the band broke up because they just needed to spend more time with their family. So he went solo. And he wrote this song called All Together. And it's really, the th I think it should be the theme of this weekend. We're, we're doing this. We're going to do it all together. Okay? We're, we're, we're in it together. So this song is called All Together. Pretty cool song, yeah? Mike, uh, he, he wrote a, a bunch of books, and then they're all, he lives, he lives this lifestyle. I've actually reached out to him and asked him if I can interview him, and, and, and we were supposed to do it uh, last year, but hopefully we'll, we'll do it back again, and I would like to have him come out here as a, as a guest speaker. He dedicated his lives to helping people find healing. And so we, we got we to do this all together, okay? Okay, th so this last part is if you open up your trifold, if you look at the back of it, let's put together a mission statement, something we can commit to, especially to launch off 2023. If you see there, the mission statement, okay? An example, if you look at um, my and Grady and my picture in the, on the back of the pamphlet, we put our mission statements there. That's our life mission. If you see my picture there with my family, my life mission is to turn my ears into graves where people bury their problems and begin healing. That's just, that's for me personally. What's Mr. Grady's life mission? May I see this? I'll, I'll read Mr. Grady's life mission here. To live simply and slow enough to be available, attentive, 
and kind to the people in my life. That is beautiful. Thank you, Grady. If you've ever hung out with Mr. Grady, he, he is all of those things. He's present. So we'll use this last uh, moments here to, for your personal mission statement, what are some things you learned this weekend? And how is it going to impact how you, how you live? And then, as a family, if you can do this now, if, if, if you don't knock it out now, um, chances are you're probably not going to do it later. So as a family, once you compare your, your personal ones, have a family one where you commit to something new based off of something new that you learned this weekend. Some of the lives, some of the families in this, in this room this week are never going to be the same. Are never going to be the same, and so this, there has to be a new mission. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes for that, and then we will we'll conclude. Yeah, yeah, let's make one. Let's make one. Okay. Ryder, Ryder, come with us. We're going to make one.